Welcome to the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Principles Global Community, or 3PGC, is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles as introduced by Sydney Banks to people throughout the world. Today we have Amy Chen Mills Naim with Grief, Love, and Empowerment Facing the Climate and Ecological Crises from a Principles Understanding. And a bit about Amy. She is the author of State of Mind in the Classroom, Thought, Consciousness, and the Essential Curriculum for Healthy Learning with her late father, Dr. Roger C. Mills, and The Spark Inside, a special book for youth. She's a poet, an essayist, global speaker trainer, and radio show and podcast host with her own YouTube channels on spirituality and political and climate activism. She is the former director of the Center for Sustainable Change, and you can find her work at Amy Chen, that's Amy with an I, dot com. And not only that, Amy is running for office right now. So this is, uh, she has a lot to share with us about bringing the three principles into the world and making a difference with it. So thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. What a great introduction. And thank you for you know, taking the lead on these webinars. It's wonderful to have you. You're just a perfect fit, <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I apologize if you came on the last time and I missed you. I was, I really thought it was at 11 a.m. Pacific time. That's what I'm used to for every other 3PGC webinar. So I put it as 11 in my calendar. And then I was on another webinar and maybe I was with a client I know I was on Zoom somehow and people were texting me. I just, so I'm very sorry if you were on that one. I heard you actually had some good connection and brought up some good issues. So I appreciate Stephanie for thinking on her feet in that way. Um, and we may have some new folks who are joining on from Santa Cruz who know me as a candidate for District 3 supervisor. And I'm running as, with climate as one of my central platforms. So, uh, so this is all fitting together quite well. Um, so I would love to hear first, just to get some intake, what you are sort of facing, looking at, feeling inside yourself about the climate crisis and or about uh, the war with Ukraine and, you know, just we're facing so many challenges. We've still got coronavirus happening and running in the background. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like we have different levels of crises happening. And honestly, this is one of the reasons I'm running as well is to bring the mental health piece and sort of the capacity to face this and respond to, to my community at the county level where there are resources for, for response. So. Um, so I'd love, but just let's make this about you for a little while. If you could answer that question, sort of like, why are you here? What would you like to, to, to understand and try to keep it around, you know, one to two minutes. So, and it doesn't have to be everybody, but I'd love to get just a feel for where people are at right now. Yeah. So if you would like to share that with Amy, um, you can unmute yourself by going down to the bottom of your menu to the reaction or put up your hand, please, to click on the reactions button, and then you'll see a little digital hand to raise your hand and we'll unmute you so you can share with Amy. And you're also welcome to use the chat box as well. Ah, Denise. Hi, good morning. Um, I actually work in the environmental field um, I do work around watershed restoration in the Pacific Northwest, primarily focused on um, bringing back wetlands, for, primarily for ju juvenile salmonid habitat. And I have been looking in the direction of the three principles for several years, and I I've often thought there has to be, there's definite, there's connections, right, between three principles and the work that I do, but I just thought it would be, I've never had a, con a specific conversation about it with anybody before, and I just thought it would be really nice to join you and um, to be a part of a community that's looking in this direction around something that's um, 
you know, climate change is really, you know, it's such a big thing. And so, yeah, just trying to bring the idea of innate health to thinking about our planet as a whole. And, um, and how that really can op open up creativity um, to see different ways to move forward. And I, I see that in my own work and, and with the staff that I lead is the more that I look in the direction of all of our innate health, the more opportunities open up for us. And so I just thought it would be really nice to to join in and, and see where this conversation leads. So thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank you for your work, Denise. And the reason you might not be seeing the questioners is because there's sort of a policy of everyone doesn't want their face on YouTube. <laughs> so, so that's why um, I've been pinned. Um, you know how wonderful that you're doing this work in, uh, ha is it habitat restoration work? It sounds like, yeah. Um, and I think that that's something that from my history in the three principles community, um, that's not a field that we've been moving into. We move into corporate consulting, we move into um, schools and we move into correctional facilities and we move into even you know, at risk communities, but environment and ecology has not been a focus. And so it's, you know, it just warms my heart that here you are bringing principles of innate resiliency into your work and, and what a, a blessing that is and a benefit because you will be able to speak to your staff and to others about how this is helping you. And this is some of the most essential work that we have you know, uh, you know, uh, to, to deal with right now. This is some of the most essential work we should be doing. So thank you, Denise, for, for chiming in. Yeah, anybody else? We have a comment from Jane that was put into the chat that I'll read. Um, she said, she's here, overwhelm, powerlessness in the face of corporate control. And at the same time, knowing the importance of right action, start where you are and go from there. Connect, connect, connect. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> you know, connection is so important right now. And that's, you know, as I've been thinking about my community and my campaign, I've been thinking about how can we build community? Because that feels like a part of what we need to do locally so that we can support each other as disasters like wildfires happen. And it's not even when they happen, it's as they are happening now. Um, so I really appreciate that. Jane is a part of my campaign team. She's a former mayor in our city and council member, an amazing, wonderful woman. And she teaches positive discipline, which, which um, Jane Nelson, who's the founder of Positive Discipline, which is this global movement to, you know, treat young people with respect, right? <laughs> um, she actually went to the Advanced Human Studies Institute where my father was teaching and Rick Suarez and um, where people like Bill Pettit went to learn the principles and Joe Bailey, other people in the three principles world. Um, and that Jane Nelson's first book is called, or one of her first books is called From Here to Serenity. And it's about these principles. In fact, I have it on my table, so I'll try to bring it up when we have a little break or something. I'll wave it around. It's not something a lot of people know, <laughs> but there's a connection there. Wow, cool. Yeah. We have um, Karen. I'm gonna unmute Karen. Oh, are we crossing each other? <laughs> Karen, are you able to unmute? There you go. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Amy. I miss you, Karen. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, let's see, I'm here because Amy was talking <laughs> for one. Amy, I, I totally admire and appreciate the work you're doing. And I'll start with that. And I'm, I'm here in Alaska. So we are one of the most rapidly changing environments because we're in the Arctic. Um, we have a lot melting, a lot of 
huge amount of change here in Alaska and um, it directly affects our way of life because many of us live in what we call rural Alaska in, in more remote places. And we still hunt fish and gather uh, quite a bit. And so there's a lot of change in animal patterns and even uh, effects on the fish now with warmer water, you know, our salmon run and that sort of thing. I find it very, I don't know, I, I guess for me, it's hard to believe that with the within the three principles community, we're focusing on corporate, you know, and I'm just going to be blunt and honest here, <laughs> you know, and I, I know there's specialty in different areas with, with like a lot of corporate support and, um, and different, which, you know, the different disciplines is important, but I, I feel more and more how urgent it is in our world this is our home. This is the only home we have. And if if we don't start speaking up and doing something to address the killing of our home, it, it's going to be gone. I just saw a statistic the other day about you know, more animals and more life dying on our earth because we're getting so close. And for me, what I realize is it's, it's real easy to take my comfort and ignore what's going on. Um, but it's to a point where, you know, as I learn more and become more and more aware of what's happening in my home, I can't ignore it anymore. So with the principles, this understanding for me, it's not about, you know, getting, getting pissed off, although sometimes I do. And it, it's also not about this stuff being all fluffy and rosy. It's about addressing what's a real, real crisis in our world. And with, with the guidance of the understanding of how we're made as human beings, Feel like that direction could get a lot done and to me there should be 500 or more people on this zoom call today <laughs> well they might so, listen later you know there's hope <laughs> yeah there is always hope definitely but again i appreciate um the webinar i appreciate amy you addressing uh, this very urgent topic and I I don't usually attend these but your name came up in my inbox with the three PC, PGC deal and I I needed to be here so yeah that's where and, I'm at and what is the name of your like tribal nation is it Athabascan in in uh, Alaska is that right am I saying that right yeah it's Dina in Athabascan yeah. we're related to the Navajo and Apache. Yeah, I was reading about that, that there's a connection there. So that's, yeah. that's, that's been interesting. Thank you so much for, for joining, Karen. Um, yeah, we are on uh, the territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribal nation. And they actually, uh, the Amamutsun tribal band does a lot of work in restoring ecosystems in this area. You know, they're doing controlled burns and they're planting native plants and they're, they're very active. So um, it's cool to see, I've talked to them quite a bit. So anyone else uh, wanna chime in? Maybe we can take one or two more, especially if you're feeling something, you know, very stressful or intense. I'd like, I'd like to hear that, a little bit of that. or if you're confused. Is anybody just, I'm all good. 
<laughs> I'm all good with climate. <laughs> Amy, I have a couple comments that were from the last session that might fall under that. If you want yeah. me to read them, I can. Um, so let's see. One comment that came in was, I mourn for the future generations who will inherit the planet in such a mess. Um, someone else said, I think we have a real chance of cooling the planet in a timely fashion through re restoring the soil carbon sponge. I am curious where Amy is or others are in terms of this opinion. Uh, let's see. With a 3P understanding, we know that the nudges that arise from our quiet mind can be trusted. And we also increasingly understand from indigenous and traditional wisdom and from modern biology and physics that the planet is a single complex living system of which we are an intrinsic part that regulates itself through many feedback loops. So might our nudges be a part of that feedback system prompting us to pay to play our unique part in rebalancing the earth. And someone else asked, how can we best connect with naysayers so as to center our energy on creating timely and effective solutions to human created climate change? Yeah. Okay, is that it? For That's those? it for now, yes. Okay, great. Um, well, I think that I'll just kind of launch. <laughs> and then I think as I go along, there may be questions that pop up or we can have more questions later. And I'll just share with you my own experience um, first, which is sort of learning about the state of things. You know, I, I thought that climate was a serious issue. I was pretty convinced it was human made just because of the way I saw the narrative change when fossil fuel companies got involved in trying to influence the narrative um, many years ago. People actually believed in climate change and man-made climate change in the beginning. And then that, uh, that belief dipped as the um, disinformation campaign started to come out from ExxonMobil and Shell and through the Heartland Institute. Um, so that's where Karen, that's where I get a little angry <laughs> at that point. <laughs> and you know, we don't want to live in our anger because it's, it takes its toll on our mental health and our, our physicality. But I'm also not, I'm not averse to anger sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm not averse to the expression of anger as uh, um, a, a, a part of our discernment of what's happening in the world. You know, I think sometimes we can be um, so sort of spiritually trained that we're like, oh, I can't be angry, I can't be upset, I can't be anxious. And, and I, I'm sure that a lot of other practitioners have done their best on these webinars to dispel that idea. But I know for me, I've gone through many emotions and it's been important to allow all of those emotions. And I've also been gaslit sometimes in having those emotions. And to me, gaslit means you know, oh, it's not a big deal or, oh, it's all gonna be fixed. It's, you know, um, to me, again, that's not what spirituality is about. It's not about fixing everything outside so you can feel well, right? It's really about feeling well, even when our circumstances are challenging. It's not about denying the circumstances. Um, and so in terms of our actual circumstances, I got to work on climate, um, after watching the sea stars, the starfish die in Mitchell's Cove, which is where I used to take my kids to play in the tide pools. And then as a journalist, I did research on why they were dying. And I found out it was sea star wasting syndrome. I heard that they would come back in a couple of years, but in the end they sort of didn't. And then it, I learned it was because the oceans were warming. So it was harder for them to recover. And then I learned that because the sea stars were dying, especially the, the giant sunflower star, urchins were exploding and they were eating the kelp beds. And at some point we lost 90% of our kelp beds up and down the coast. And I thought kelp beds, you know, that's like losing grass or trees or woodland, you know, but in the ocean and that's not good. <laughs> we also have monarch butterflies that fly here um, and, and over winter in our eucalyptus trees. And a couple of years ago, they were down by 90% in one year. Um, 
So they're starting to come back. The kelp beds are actually coming back a little bit. You know, we're seeing some, some recovery, but my understanding is that as things heat up, all these different um, connected systems um, are impacted. And it's almost like the more they're impacted, the more they're impacted, right? So we're seeing reports of feedback loops from the Arctic. When the ice melts, there's more dark surface to absorb more heat. So we lose the albedo effect, which is the reflective capacity of the ice and snow, and we're losing that everywhere. So, so it's like, as we heat up, we heat up. Um, and uh, someone sent me, as I was working on climate, I was doing lobbying. I was flying to DC and talking to senators and talking to our congressperson here. Um, but in the midst of all of this working for Citizens Climate Lobby, which is trying to pass a carbon tax, um, someone sent me a paper and it was called Deep Adaptation by a Professor Jem, ben Jem Bendel at the University of Cumbria in England. And I read the paper and I remember getting mad <laughs> at the person who sent it to me because I was like, I was actually kind of okay <laughs> before you sent me this paper. And it was just this very, considered reflective analysis of the science and the IPCC reports, which are heavily influenced by governments and businesses. So they're actually very conservative. So the last IPCC report that came out should have been the one before that, right? So the one before that, we knew it was worse than what was said in the report. And this report, of course, is, is not actually going to reflect the actual reality because a lot of times they're not including the impact of these feedback loops. So the paper was about collapse, that we're looking at some form of collapse. Um, I still have hope, and it has to do with some of the things that you all talked about, the connection that we have in terms of if we all are inspired to move in a way that's productive and helpful, because climate affects everyone. You know, even the wealthy people, when we get mad about corporations, for example, right, um, they will be affected. And I think it, it takes longer for people in power to understand that the things that normally protect them and insulate them from the problems of the world, whether it's a gated community, whether it's the capacity to buy farmland, you know, and think that they can live on this farmland all by themselves with their families, like these are um, illusions. This is not going to happen because you need also someone to birth the children and you need someone to fix the, <laughs> you just, we're, we're connected. And I think that's what we're learning through the pandemic is how connected we are as we're seeing supply chains fall apart. We can't do things. My husband's trying to fix a, a, um, a motor that he has on his fishing boat and he can't get the, like he can't get it fixed anywhere because the parts and supply chain and this and that. And I've been noticing too that uh, food wise, I started thinking, well, how is this affecting food production and food transport and how is climate involved? And it just occurred to me that when, you know, fields are flooding and um, factories are flooding and bridges are washing out, you know, in British Columbia. So they, there's no possible way trucks can get through. Um, Climate is affecting supply chain disruption. I am 100% clear. And I've started tracking like when people are running out of ingredients for things to make beer, for example, or their granola bars, I'm seeing this show up in the news that they can't get these items because the crops are failing. Okay, so I'm sure everybody feels much better <laughs> after that. <laughs> but the only reason I bring that up is because if we don't face reality, we cannot respond appropriately. So facing, you know, I tell people, don't be afraid to look. And then when you look, if you're human, right, you're going to have emotions. And I've had, you know, my first emotions were when I really started to understand all of this were a great feeling of sadness, you know, just sadness. Like this is crazy what we're doing and, and what the impacts are. I mean, it's, in, it's insane and it's so sad. And then I moved into sort of like anxiety, <laughs> a lot of adrenaline, like, 
I think for a while I was like, I'm going to fix this single-handedly. <laughs> so I started Extinction Rebellion in my hometown and helped to organize the massive climate strikes that happened in 2019 and organized civil disobedience dances, you know, to staying alive at Chase Bank to get them to divest from fossil fuels. And I still go to Chase Bank once a month and I'll probably still be involved in the climate strikes, but I see that all as one phase of my response, you know, and then to just grieving and weeping, you know, I've walked through my woods just weeping, you know, and, and I, I remember being once we were on holiday, we were in a different location than here and it was pouring, pouring rain and it was nighttime and I just started to, to weep and it almost felt like the rain was, it was so loud. It, 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 it was noisy rain, that's how much it was raining. And my tears were like the same, the same thing. So um, I am not averse to emotions. And I mean, I'm sure most of you are not, but I know that we can be afraid of them. And I think that that is actually some of the underlying psychology around climate denial is if I actually look, if I acknowledge what's happening, I don't think I can handle the emotions that I'll have. So I think in some ways for me, that gives me um, some perspective on people I meet who don't think it's happening or sometimes they don't wanna talk about it. I, I understand that that's a self-protective mechanism and for me, running for office, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how people respond to my take on the situation because it is reality-based as far as I'm concerned, right? So, um, so there's this psychological component, which as we know from the principles is when we look at something like this, our tendency is to create the future in our minds. Like there are things that are happening. We've had huge fires. But then when we continue to create a future of disaster and you know who knows what, um, that's what creates our feeling state. And while it's important to acknowledge the science and what's happening, also we don't need to futurize all the time, right? And that's been very important for me because if I do that, then I go into staying in those feelings. So, I'm allowing feelings to arise and also to pass. Um, and here's the, here's the most profound, I think, and challenging piece of looking at the climate crisis is we have heard in three principles psychology time and time again, your feeling state is not contingent on your circumstances. Your well being, your mental health are actually not contingent on anything outside of you. And that's a challenge for everyone just in their normal personal lives <laughs> to understand, right? But around climate, it's, it's sort of like the biggie as far as I'm concerned. And the invitation for me is to step more deeply into the present because we still have so much beauty and diversity and you know, biology and life and wonderful people trying to do like Denise, wonderful things. Um, and so we do have a choice about where to put our thinking once we've accepted, you know, reality, accepted the science, then we have a choice about where to put our thinking. And what I've sort of come to also is um, it feels good to just do your best. I'm not saying that's mandatory. If you, maybe your best is like, uh, the best for me is I wanna just love my family, ha grow a garden, <laughs> you know, or try to help my community with their mental health. That's A-OK -okay with me. I, my big thing has been, let's not be in denial. And then whatever happens from stepping out of denial and into our wisdom, is going to be the right thing. What I don't trust is when people seem to be in denial. Um, and I, I was asked to quote from Sydney Banks. So I was looking this morning about where does Sydney Banks talk about climate change in his book? <laughs> I 
and I couldn't find anything or in the index, but he does talk about, you know, thought. And that's still true for all of us, regardless of the situation we're in. Even like I was thinking about the Ukraine and how intense that situation is, you know, and here you have this president in his t-shirt, you know, like, come and get us. We're not afraid of you. <laughs> I'm just like, wow, okay, you know, there's that capacity too. You know, there's the, 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 the endless capacities we have as human beings to respond to even the worst of situations. And now with the war, we're all concerned, you know, there have been explosions at nuclear power plants. And so we're all concerned, um, you know, but one of the things that I, I understand about the history of the world is that we've been, the, the planet itself has been through mass extinctions um, where almost everything, all life was eliminated except for some very small, like single celled creatures or, or whatever. Um, and we've been through a lot of crazy things in our, in our history. And, we've, and we're now in that period of time of going through crazy things. So it's not new to human beings. And in every situation, you can find people who find this resiliency, this capacity to remain loving, to be courageous, to take action. Um, and one of the things that just occurred to me as I was talking just now, and I'd love to hear what you guys are doing about this is there's so much to think about, right? The pandemic's still with us, the war, climate crisis, political, you know, a lot of political, um, intensity in the United States and elsewhere. Um, the capacity we have also and the opportunity to sometimes think about things and sometimes not, you know, sometimes just be with, you know, I have a little dog back there. I have two cats. I have my family. And I, I once was talking to a climate activist. I said, you know, she, she went to go dancing. She loves to dance. And she said, I, I, I wasn't thinking about the climate crisis. I was just dancing. And I said, oh, you forgot. And she said, well, no, no, I didn't forget. I didn't forget. It was almost like she had this feeling of responsibility. I have to keep thinking about this all the time. She said, no, no, I have to hold it. And I said, no, you can forget. <laughs> you know? Sometimes it's just good to forget. Because if you are constantly thinking about these issues, right, it's, it's going to weigh on you and then your mental health will go down and you won't respond well to, to your family, to, to your you know, place of work, to whatever project you're involved in, right? So I think it's okay to forget. And that doesn't mean you go out and buy, you know, like a huge truck or something to drive around, but it just means that like you, you can let it go. You can let it go for a while. And especially if you understand that it's impacting your mental health. That's the, the indicator, right, is your feeling state. If it's starting to get too anxious or whatever, then you, you let it go. And that can feel for people who are very responsible people and who are activists and who care and who do a lot for their communities and for life and for the world, that can feel very challenging. Um, so, um, so here's Sid on thought. Your personal mind activates your thoughts and makes them good or bad. You have no control over what others think, but you do have the power to control what you think. In the silence beyond all things lies the divine knowledge that will help guide you through life. Look within your own consciousness, for here lies the answer to all of humanity's problems. And I think in the past, we have seen these words as just, oh, I just need to get quiet and be in my good feelings and discover my spiritual dimension. And, and that's very, I can't, I can't um, over, overestimate how impactful that is and how important that is. I think it's very important because that's where your wisdom comes from. But I also don't think it means that we don't act. I think that going into your own consciousness you know, is finding out what is meant for you to do. What is yours to do? 
somehow in my consciousness, running for office seemed like a good idea. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> I had a good feeling about it. <laughs> uh, um, and then I wanted to share around the Ukraine war and the political situation and just the craziness uh, the way Sid Banks talks about this. Cut off from innate wisdom, a lost thinker experiences isolation, fear, and confusion. This is why there are so many horrible atrocities throughout the world. Newspapers are full of wars, killing, killings, children starving. Ignorance of our own inner wisdom is the cause of sin. There would be no sin without such ignorance. The malfunction of our own personal thought system instigates the breakdown of personal relationships and leads to the crumbling of societies causing unnecessary suffering and sadness. This is interesting. It's almost, you know, a prescient on Sid's part. Uh, before he died, he actually said, according to Dick and Bettinger, things are getting worse, you know, which actually was a surprise for me to hear in the outside. The misled thoughts of humanity, humanity alienated from their inner wisdom, cause all violence, cruelty, and savagery in this world. Um, he doesn't end with a positive here, <laughs> but there's a lot of positives in the book, as you know. And it occurs to me, as Denise said, that the antidote, no matter how far gone we are climate-wise, no matter what's happening, in our societies, in our on our planet, uh, is always to go into finding our wisdom, because that is not impacted by our circumstances. People who responded to the fires here, as I've met with them up in Bonnie Dune, they're all responding differently. You know, some people are very upset that you know that they got burned out of their homes, and I understand that. That's certainly understandable. I'd probably be upset too. I met one man who's living in an RV. He said he lost $400,000 worth of ceramic art in his ceramic studio as well. The whole house burned to the ground. And he also said, the fire was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I said, why? I'm really curious about that. He said, because I realized I don't need all that stuff. I'm living in an RV with my family. We have a little fire at night when we can, and I still go surfing. You know, there was something he really realized. I believed him. And so he was experiencing this whole challenge of having his home burned and trying to rebuild it. You know, it's very challenging for folks up there to rebuild um, in a totally different way than, than other folks. And that's always true for us in the midst of climate crisis, in the midst of war. You know, even I just interviewed Joe Bailey on, on the radio. He just wrote a book. Uh, Dr. Joe Bailey is a, is a principles-based psychologist and he wrote a book called um, Thriving in the Eye of the Hurricane. And he has examples in there of people who lived through the Holocaust even and somehow maintained their sense of love and well-being. He has the stories in the book. Um, so, yeah, so I think, is there anything else I wanted to share? Oh, someone asked about soil, the carbon, the carbon sponge. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sort of of two minds. One is, you know, I met this woman on a plane. Her name is Tia. She lives in the Four Rivers area of Australia and she just was posting on social media her entire like county region, whatever they call it, is underwater. And people are running out of clean water, food, medicine. And she's like, no one's coming to help us. It's been, it's been a couple of days now, no one has come to help us and we need these medicines for people. And I'm looking at this territory, this neighborhood, it's a, it looks like actually a, um, a very nice, you know, kind of upper class area. And so, you know, I tried to post to share what was happening there. And I understand this is all happening. And at the same time, 
there are, there are some solutions that are very promising and regenerative agriculture is one of the most promising solutions that I have seen. Um, in, in the movie, Kiss the Ground, you know, there's a whole um, description of what that is. Um, and it can draw down a lot of carbon if we were to scale up very, very quickly. And it brings back biodiversity to farmland, you know, because healthy soils draw down carbon. And then of course you don't need as much pesticides and fertilizers uh, to do your farming because your soils are healthy. So your plants are healthier and doing better and you're doing cover crops and hedgerows. So you've got um, different insects and birds coming back to your farmland. So I'm actually involved in a, in a campaign, supporting a campaign here in my county called Cora. I think it's called the Committee for Organic and Regenerative Agriculture. And I have a YouTube video interviewing one of the top scientists in our state about regenerative agriculture at my YouTube channel. And it's something I've already started talking to county supervisors about, and some of them are already starting to plan meetings with farmers and talking to people at Chico State about regenerative agriculture, like the guy I interviewed for the YouTube video. So yes, yes, regenerative agriculture, <laughs> for sure. But we definitely need, and someone talked about the naysayers and we're not gonna have the momentum for that if we don't understand the situation that we're in and accept it, then we can move. And so not everyone is good at having these conversations. It's something I wanna try to um, initiate in this district, in the county actually is, is having conversations, dialogues with people who live here as part of government functions, like more open dialogues than the two minutes, three minutes you get to speak to the city council or the, or the county board of supervisors. But um, yeah, so I think if you are interested in helping people dialogue and getting information across, that is a really good use of time. Um, posting on social media, I think can be helpful. I've actually heard from people saying, I'm so thankful to the people who argued with me on Twitter and social media because I was really kind of very reactionary or right wing, right wing or whatever. And I really, I'm really grateful that people took the time to, to even have an argument with me and I've, I've really changed. So there is definitely um, a dominant narrative around climate that's about denialism or some, now it's going to China. Well, China's doing this and that, so <laughs> we don't have to do anything. And that's not helpful, right? Because we can't control China. We can control what we do. Um, and what I've noticed too, here, I'll just give you an example of a naysayer. So I went up to Bonnie Dune and I was talking to someone who's a bunch of guys whose house is burned down and they were kind of like good old American guys, you know, like my dad, <laughs> Roger Mills. Some of you may know him. He was a pioneer in this psychology. and. I mentioned climate change and this guy just rolled his eyes like, oh, as if it really didn't affect the fires or anything, you know, that had burned his house down. And um, I just kept, I didn't push it. You know, I just kept listening. And so I think that when we really listen, people begin to, to trust that we're not there to shove something down their throats that we also, you know, in this case, I wanna help people, um, you know, if I'm elected, get their permits right? They don't have to believe in climate change to get their permits and to harden, fire harden their properties. But, um, but the more we can interact with one another, understanding that we do come from separate realities. The reason this person doesn't believe in climate change is because of whatever narratives they're, they've been looking at or exposed to. And so it may take time, right, to shift those narratives. But I do believe it's worth the effort. And I think that if we can listen to people and connect, because I like this guy, like he just, I wanted to give him a big hug, you know, because he was very sweet and a big guy, you know, but um, I don't know if he'd agree with all my politics, but I just felt this tenderness toward him. And we have to remember that. And, you know, there've been times when, you know, I'm not opposed to sometimes you just start yelling because that seems like the thing to do. <laughs> I, when I started Extinction Rebellion in Santa Cruz, 
I saw this one young man, he was down on Pacific Avenue, which is our downtown. He just stepped into the middle of the road and started yelling about runaway global warming because he was so frustrated and he wouldn't leave and finally the police came and someone just put a sign in front of him that said Extinction Rebellion. Um, and that's how I connected with him. I thought, oh, he's starting Extinction Rebellion. And when I met with him, he's like, no, I was just yelling in the middle of the street because I was so frustrated. But there was some power in his just expressing his emotion um, because sometimes emotions are, sometimes they're just more suffering for us and sometimes they're really an expression of, of love. We love the planet. We love each other. We love animals and species and flora and fauna. And when you love, you protect and sometimes you get angry. So I don't have rules about how to feel, except all I know is that I can come back to my, into my, my own quietness and, you know, sort out just what, what am I about in, in relation to all of this. So that was a lot. I just said a lot. <laughs> And I'm wondering, I would love to hear, you know, so there was a, I just wrote corporate down, but I don't remember why, but I would love to hear um, holism. I'm looking at the, Jane, do you wanna talk about what that is? But we can't hear you because uh, you're muted. Of course. Um, Gemeinschaftsgefühl, the word coined by Alfred Adler uh, in the early part of the 1900s uh, as he was developing individual psychology, which is actually indivisible psychology, as holism. We are body, we are, we are spirit, we are um, mind. And um, so what's really thrilling is that Gemeinschaftsgefühl just simply says that, you know, if you really do feel belonging, and significance, then you naturally, innately, want to give back, want to be a part of and take action in a collaborative sense for the social interest, the good of all. So, and this, and so Adler's work was foundational to a lot of important psychologies. And it's, these are two concepts which help me get through the day because I don't mourn, I organize. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing right now, getting ready to host a fundraiser in my garden tomorrow. And so I'm dishwashing and wiping up and things. So thank you for your patience. And I love being here. Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Questions? Did that help? Did that answer things? Was it shocking? I don't know. Yeah, if you'd like to share with Amy, please go down to your reactions button and raise your digital hand. And then I'll ask you to unmute so you can speak with her and share your questions or maybe insights that you're having. I'm curious about Pink, both because of the name and I don't think I've met you before. I've met some other people before. Do you wanna share your thoughts? Um, yes, <clears throat> uh, I'm, spe I'm speaking from uh, Israel. Yeah, I had a feeling. My husband's from Israel, so I've been there many times. And uh, while, while you were speaking, uh, I did uh, have a thought because uh, it was in uh, 2019 that uh, I was thinking that uh, um, what what I was missing uh, was some kind of uh, view of the planet from the outside, and so. I traveled to Turkey 
I remember I was uh, thinking, uh, is it right to, to fly a jet, yes or no? But uh, I went to meet there somebody uh, who they call uh, Mevlana. Mm. And uh, I asked her about the, um, the, the carbon thing. Uh, if that's what's causing it. And, and what she said, what she told me was something that uh, only now I through while you were speaking, I, I suddenly thought, because when she said it, 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 it didn't sound uh, logical at all, but from, from uh, reading uh, what she has written and what she said to me then, now, all of a sudden, uh, I think it, it, it does make some sense because she said that uh, the, the, the climate change is caused by people's negativity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could say that, right? <laughs> really insecurity. You know, I mean, if, the interesting thing to me that kind of gets me is that, you know, here's an interesting thing you talk about flying and you're like, there's this idea of a carbon footprint, right? Well, we, sh we should reduce our, stop eating beef and stop flying. And I actually have reduced my flying quite a bit. I don't fly like to conferences and I don't do that kind of thing. Sometimes I do, you know, uh, but you know who created the idea of the carbon footprint and the carbon calculator was British Petroleum. And they did so to deflect attention from these industries that are really working very hard to continue to extract, transport and burn fossil fuels. And why is that? Because they are in a paradigm of their own making, you know, and also society's making that more is always better, more money is always better, you know, more profit is always better, more power, more expansion. And so this thought system, this mentality, it's, it's inherently negative in the sense that of, it's always about me, it's always about the ego, right? Collecting more to enhance one's idea of oneself. And that's fundamentally an illusion because you can't, you never can get enough. You never can have enough money. You never can have enough power. So people are like in this almost monopoly game of making money. I mean, after you're making 50 million, 100 million, billions, what, what do you, how do you even spend this money? <laughs> like there's some calculations, like you could spend the rest of your life just trying to spend it and you'd run out of time, you know? So so that's the piece that hopefully i mean what's interesting about what's happening in ukraine is it's 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 revealing a lot and it's awful and it's terrible and it's also revealing a lot about things that have to do with pipelines and fossil fuels and um and vladimir putin and you know and also his relationships in the united states um so I think it's a t it's, it, it, it occurs to me, and it probably has occurred to all of you, we are in a time of tremendous upheaval and seeing. And in the seeing, which we shouldn't be afraid of seeing, although we can, we can um, space it out, we don't have to see everything at once, you know, right? we, we have our wisdom to guide us around how much we can see and take in in the seeing combined with our understanding about our own wisdom, that to me is, is, the, is the only answer. You know, whether it's toward mitigation and maybe we can still turn this around or whether it's toward, I wanna just take care of my community, I wanna focus on that or adapt, engage in adaptation measures, which I think we need to do actually. Um, that's that's it. That's sort of like the, the the crucible of where the money is, quote unquote, in terms of the principles and climate. 
is understanding our own, that we have our own wisdom on about what to do. And my running for office is part of that. You know, even if I don't win in the runoff or to get to the runoff, my website, my ideas, my interviews, what's going out there is this message, right? So it's getting out there. I, I hope that's part of what, why I'm doing this. And what a crazy idea. <laughs> And also, you know, when I first started uh, writing about climate, I didn't see anyone else writing or talking about climate at the conferences or anywhere in, in our community. I mean, there are other communities that are very, there's some Buddhist communities that are very committed. The co-counseling communities, one of its platforms is we must respond to the climate crisis. But ours, this, this was something new. And, um, and I just knew that if I started to speak out, it would be, um, possibly bad for me, you know, in my career. Uh, and so, but then I was like, well, do I want to pretend like I don't know, or this isn't happening, or that it doesn't concern me, or that I don't think we should talk about it? No, I don't want to pretend. So here I am, I'm going to say this. And I wrote a piece on Medium called A Letter to My Spiritual Colleagues. That was the first thing I wrote to the Three Principles community. Um, and I happily discovered there were a few people who were concerned, but that concern was pretty small. And then over these last couple of years with more fires and floods and, and activism and climate strikes and Greta Thunberg and, you know, people showing up at the COP26 to protest. I mean, all of that makes a difference. And so I see that the, it's, things are shifting toward being more awake to what's happening. Karen, you had your hand up. Thanks for all you've shared, Amy. <clears throat> One thought I had as I listened is the concept you mentioned of connection. And, you know, the thought came to me that how much we see ourselves as separate and we're not separate. Our planet is one whole interconnected system. What happens in another part of the world affects all of us. And we can see this with this COVID crisis going on. And so I had a thought of, you know, that interconnectedness. The climate crisis is not separate from corporate or from social issues or from education. It's all interconnected. We're all part of the whole. And that's one of the worldviews of indigenous people throughout the world is that, that deep interconnectedness. And I think one of, one of the keys is seeing, being aware of that we're not separate. And the closeness to the natural world, the concept, you know, that concept of what we care about, we will speak up for. And I don't think there's many people that don't care about the natural world and the earth. We just need to remember, you know, who we are and where we come from. It, it seems so simple. <laughs> it seems so simple, but, um, just really that concept of interconnectedness is, it really struck me, so, yeah. And even as, as people, right, like uh, I think about social justice and racial justice issues and the more I explore and try to understand the views of different people in our country, whether black people, you know, Asian, I'm Asian. And so I've been trying to speak about our experience, especially in my community where we had Chinatowns and a lot of them were burned down, you know, and there was a huge push to expel Chinese people from out of here. Um, the more we can understand, you know, and, and this is what occurs to me about indigenous people is that there's, there's something there that's so profound to understand. And as we begin to understand each other's cultures and histories that we can then appreciate that we're, we're connected. So if we don't sort of respect and elevate 
the truth in indigenous views of the world, which actually Sydney Banks uh, wrote a whole book called um, Young Medicine Man, which is based on in what he saw as indigenous spirituality and the idea of one spirit. There's one spirit and we, we respect that in all living things all living things and you know I think about being a child you know and uh I used to go to the beach and the waves would come in and I remember I'd have a name for every wave I would name and they were my friends and I was playing with the waves you know I had this whole thing going on with the waves and then when I'd leave I'd say goodbye it's been a long time saying goodbye and there's some we've we've disconnected from that feeling right that the earth all these elements of earth are they're all relatives of ours right they're all and i and i do i actually have an essay i, I recommend people go to my medium account some things are about politics and some things are about climate but i have something called what to do about the climate crisis and what occurred to me was the more we can spend time in nature as you do karen quite a bit i know especially when you're at camp um there's some information that comes in there's some it helps us settle our minds and be grateful and then be sort of more determined to protect you know and and in that quietness of mind we gain wisdom about what to do for us what to do thank you any other thoughts questions, even arguments. Yeah, Denise. Oh, Denise and then Vera. Um, well, I wanted to say a couple things. One is I hadn't realized until this conversation how much I've needed this understanding to look in this direction. I mean, I do this work every day. It's what I do for a living. Um, but I also do it because I, I really believe in being of service. Um, uh, to my community and, and, and to the, um, the natural world where I live. And um, so I wanted to say thank you first. <laughs> um, just this conversation has been quite touching. Um, and, and when you said, you know, climate change is caused by insecurity, I, I see that so clearly. Um, I didn't, I hadn't thought about it in that way until you said that, but you know, there's, and you talked about regenerative agriculture. I feel like there, like there are so many spaces and places in the world where if we could just allow our minds to settle enough to where we can unplug from the way that we've always done things, there's there's so the natural world is our partner. As Karen said, we're all connected. It wants to assist us. You, regenerative agriculture. I we do a lot of work around blue carbon and and restoring wetlands as carbon sinks. Um, you know looking at forestry, for moving beyond like rotational agriculture of forestry and understanding how these larger trees benefit the world, you know, in such a deeper way. And um, there's such this desire to do things the way we've always done. And, 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 uh, and there's a fear there. And I sometimes think it's a fear and a greed and a like, this is just how we've always done it and an unwillingness to look beyond it. There, there's so much hope. I feel like when I quiet, because, because I just feel like there's so much hope. The natural world is our partner There's and wisdom is behind us. There's so much we can do. And the cynicism and the, the anger, I, I don't under I don't understand it, Amy. I just don't because I mean, in terms of from people who are denying, who are basically like, no, this is the way we've always done it and we're not gonna change. 
And I'm like, the problem is intractable unless we do. Why is that so hard to see? I don't, it just, if we were to come together, we can totally change it. We could flip it. It would be a story for millennia. Well, patience, right? We chip away and then we don't know what the outcome. And I mean, I didn't know I'd be doing these webinars for 3PGC a few years ago. It didn't look like that was gonna happen. I was still going back and forth with people who are organizers of major events and they didn't believe and I was sending them documents and, you know, um, and also trying to stay on their side, you know, also I'm not, I have no personal problem with you. I understand that you're coming from this culture or that culture and that's the thought system. So I tell you this running for office business, if anyone has any questions, I could talk about that, but talk about letting go of outcomes. It's like, we don't, you know, our chances are slim given the situation where people started early, they've got lots of money, they've got a consult, one of them has a consulting firm, you know. Um, and if I think about that, this has to be end up this way or that way, it gets too heavy for me. And that's the same with climate. It's like, we can't, it can't, it can't be that we know what's going to happen. And, you know, my other spiritual teacher besides Sid is Gangaji, and I just love her because she's a woman and she's well-educated around news and different issues. And I, I just trust her. It's very simple, very direct. And I, I once um, asked her about, I think it was about our politics or maybe it was about climate too. And she said, civilizations have come and gone. At least we have each other. And I, I appreciated that because it wasn't, oh, we're definitely going to get out of this. You know, like, oh, we just have to find our, you know, inner, you know, we'll all, you know, things will, something will happen. That's how I used to think. Oh, we'll figure it out. I'm not so sure. I think that there's a chance, but I'm not sure that we're going to figure it out. Who, you know, which way will people's minds go? Will they go deeper into fear or will they be able to release? But I know that the only way that we can have the, the most impact toward everyone releasing is when we release. So that in our conversations, we're not attached to the outcome of how that conversation goes. If we put something out with courage to the world, we're not attached to what might happen to us because we've been brave and said something true, right? So, um, and that's really ultimately, ultimately, you know, the, the ideas I used to have about climate from a spiritual perspective were like, oh, well, we're all going to die and, you know, form comes and goes. And I would say those things, but also thinking climate change won't happen until, you know, a hundred years from now, maybe we'll start to see. And so when I really learned about what was happening now, I had to re sort of go back into those beliefs and see if they were knowings for me. Because ultimately we're just a speck, right? We're a speck in a possibly multi polyverse. <laughs> it just, this earth is tiny, minuscule. And it's also everything to us, right? So it's a paradox. And so when you, it's, it's like, that's the invitation to go into that deeper place of we are okay regardless. We are okay. And there's something, you know, much deeper that we can tap into and be in to get through and to be in, to, and to be in this. And Denise, I'm so glad you found your way, right? Really glad. Anyone else? Dave is my good friend from North Carolina. Oh, Vera, sorry, you had your hand up before. Go ahead. <clears throat> so the, the word that's kind of hanging for me around a lot is love. Hmm. Um, 
and that's it, that feels totally crucial at the moment you know when i look at the uh when i look at my actions for example you know uh, rubbish collecting on the bay i do that every day um if i do it from the angle of my god there's always more rubbish it co totally pulls me down if i do it from the angle of this piece of rubbish isn't going to end up in a fish belly now because i removed it from here and it's a lot for me it's a lot to do with that with the seeing because one uh you know, the reality is I can't do much. Any one of us can't do much, no matter how much we do. But we can, if we flip it sli slightly, um, we see that we can do something and we do do something. And from there we connect with hope to each other. And I feel that the message from the Ukraine is so strong at the moment because that's what Zelensky is putting out. He kind of links up with love and in, in all simplicity. And he says, yeah, you know, they're gonna have me sooner or later. Um, and still, uh, uh, so there's, there's that. The, I'm just gonna offer some snippets. There's another snippet, which I find I've not lived through any other wars, luckily, but I believe that what makes this war very different is that the interconnectedness, mm -hmm. the mobile phones in the, in the overflowing tube stations or um, uh, at the borders, you know, there is like a world web or European wide web, but probably further than that, of love and of honesty. So, you know, I, to me, it's pointing, there are bigger forces at work that on a linear level, we can't see them, but there is a multifaceted web at work where when we pull one string, the whole thing moves. And the key for it is love. I am absolutely, I find no better place to stand in this, you know, that I don't know, I cannot know whether we are in the birth canal for a new age. You know, the birth, the new age that people have been speaking about, you know, that the wise ones have been speaking about this for a long time. You know, being in a birth canal feels probably shit. <laughs> you know, we've all been there, we've all forgotten it, but I don't think it feels good, maybe necessarily. But we are the breaking wave. We have an interconnectivity, like there's a guy who researches nothing else but that, you know, the coming of this, of this uh, age that is power with rather than power over. And he sees this as a very crucial ingredient. The, that like about 85% of the human population are directly or indirectly connected to each other with mobile phones or computers. So whatever travels, travels incredibly fast, including innovations. And everything that we look at with love thrives. And you know, kids do that in in primary schools when they when they do tests with sunflower seeds and they feed some of the sunflower seeds just with water and uh, in nutrients, and the other ones get the same food and they get said, "Hello, good morning," and I'm looking forward to you coming up. And guess which ones thrive? Mm -hmm. So it's like the evidence that nature responds directly. I wonder, I wonder how the waves felt when I was saying hello and yes. giving them names. Um, Absolutely. I have to, Vera, I have to say, I think that you are at Findhorn, is that right? Findhorn is this very famous um, farm garden. Um, and what, I forget what country, is it in Sweden or somewhere oh. else? Where? Scotland. Scotland. Scotland, in Scotland, that's right. 
And the way that Findhorn came about was also very intuitive. And I can't remember the name of, it was a woman, wasn't it? Who, who said, we need to build a farm here. And everyone said, no, this is not a good place. <laughs> and then she went ahead and she was really paying attention and saying, we need to plant in this way and that way. It was all coming through her intuitive faculties. Is that right? Yeah, the story was slightly different, but yeah, you can, you can, it's, it's in that, in that direction, but like you have Michelle Small Wright in, uh, in America, big project. She's doing exactly the same, the same What's thing. Name? What's her Be name? Michelle Small Wright, behaving as if God in all life mattered is a book that she's written. Michelle Small Wright and Denise, can you, can you just mention your nonprofit or agency or government branch who are you working for so people could reach out to you if they're in did you say you were in Oregon or um, Washington or um, yeah so I run a council of governments uh, on both sides of the we focus on the Columbia River and the Columbia River estuary and we're our name's a little long it's the Columbia River estuary study task force or crest for short and we're based in Astoria Oregon yeah okay. great so people could reach out if you're in Oregon, go help Denise. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit from Dave because I just haven't talked to him in so long. And also Jennifer, <laughs> I haven't talked to in so long. And Erica is from Santa Cruz, I believe. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Hi. I really appreciate this call, but I also really appreciate your running for office. <laughs> so just want to encourage you on that and uh, let you know that what I've continued to work with in look, searching for new ways of connection is this word that we've, we're so connected to was community. And I think that, you know, the opportunities for people to be connected, to be in community, is the source of finding access to that love that Vera was talking about. So, at any rate, we'll touch, we'll catch it up some other time. But I really appreciate it. Thank you. Dave was uh, the director of Habitat for Humanity in North Carolina, and then he became a project partner in our National Community Resiliency Project and organized his whole neighborhood which was a pretty troubled neighborhood. And we came in and did classes with the residents and police. And um, we saw the crime rate go down. We saw <laughs> civic engagement go up. So um, anyway, it's good to see you. Yeah. Great to see you. Thank you. Oh, good. There's the website in the chat, columbiaestuary.org, columbiaestuary.org. That's Denise's organization. Anyone else? have a thought. Robert Gilman, based in Seattle. There's also a group called um, Common Earth that is bringing in the three principles with climate science. They're based in Canada, Common Earth. I think it's commonearth.org. Um, and they've invited me to speak. I've been a speaker for them on the same topic. And uh, they take people through a free program in groups. Um, cohorts and they look at the science and they look at the solutions together and they look at their mental health and their resiliency and then they all sort of go out and do things from there so I, I that's probably the only other program I've heard of that is a climate principles based program oh so, uh, anyone and you can I just say PS I've yes. put it in I, I've put it in the chat the uh, Robert Gilman uh, website context.org um you know this is the thing for me the single most best research i've come across of studying humanity's phases of development and like pointing how far we actually are although it looks so dire but it, we are so far in the tipping of like a, a two and a half thousand year old paradigm or three thousand year old paradigm like we're practically there and and he teaches 
people like and um, those courses that intentionally weave people from different continents, different ages, backgrounds together to learn together and they create like a growing network. It's, it's fabulous to check out, see if it resonates. Okay, and I also put um, a book that's come out in the last couple of years called The Ministry for the Future that a lot of people have said have given them a lot of hope um, I've heard he also might be a little more technology oriented, whereas I tend to be more earth based, but I'm, I'm thinking we're going to need some technology <laughs> at this point, if it's safe, you know, if we can make sure it's not going to make the situation worse, which is what a lot of these technologies uh, may do. So he, he is love based. He is not technology based, but has the, has the knowledge. The, the, the author of the ministry for the future. Oh, no, no, no. No. the one well, okay I'm talking about ministry for the future okay. which i actually haven't read but many people have come to me and said this gave me hope i think it's stanley something not remembering the name but you'll find it um okay so I, any we've got five minutes and any last thoughts questions oh if you want to support my campaign <laughs> Jane, Jane would, would be so pleased that I'm saying this. The website will have a donation page very soon, amychenmills.com. So if you want to help get these ideas out, you know, and especially in my community, but, you know, I think more principles-based people should be running for office, you know, um, and, um, but you cannot donate if you're outside of the United States and you cannot donate more than $520 which I know you want to donate more. <laughs> so, okay, I think, and uh, I have resources, links I can share with Stephanie for when she posts it. How long does it take to post the, um, the video? How long does it? When it does is up? usually up very quickly. Bonnie is a speedy Gonzalez. So probably within the next couple of days at okay. the most, you'll find it on the 3PGC YouTube channel. Great. And then you can share this with others and that may be interested. So thank you, Jennifer. It's, are you there? Do you want to just say hello? I remember Jennifer from Spain. No, maybe she's... She could be just taking a walk at this point. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's, I have an 1130, so I have to run and go do that phone call. Yeah. But, um, thank you so and, much. I'm so glad it worked out in the end. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Amy. Very hopeful, very love filled. And also eyes wide open. Let's look at reality together. I, I love that so much. It's really meaningful to me too. Um, quick uh, invitation for everyone. We have a presentation next 3PGC webinar um, will be on March 15th with Carolina Bernardo. Um, and that is going to be on miracles. And that's on March 15th at 2 p.m. You can find that information on the 3PGC website. Thank you so very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Stephanie.